Hi everyone, this is Mike Lewandowski. Uh, let's begin in prayer, and then we'll give a brief summary of what we uh, discussed last time in Ezekiel, and then uh, we'll jump into chapter 11, 12, and 13 today. So, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. St. Joseph, pray for us. In the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. And I'm invoking Joseph, of course, because it's the month of March, and also because Pope Francis has declared this liturgical year, beginning in December to December, the year of St. Joseph. Okay, so when we left, left off last time in Ezekiel, we Ezekiel had this, this, this vision of the six executioners going through Jerusalem. And there was also a figure, a man in a linen cloth, who was going out there, went before the figures, and marked certain people with a, a sign, with a tau, the last letter in Hebrew, sometimes looks like a cross, sometimes looks like, looks like an X, marking them uh, to be spared the coming judgment. Because these were the people who, who wept, who, who uh, sighed over the abominations that were committed in the city. And then we left off finally with the glory cloud, the Shekinah, leaving the temple. And we said the next time we will see the glory cloud will be at the Annunciation when Gabriel tells Mary that the Holy Spirit will overshadow her. And that overshadowing, very rare word um, used in Scripture, always uh, talks about the glory cloud coming upon the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant. So, Let's jump in to chapter 11, and we're going to hear about some of the inequities, some of the sins that are taking place, and then we're going to hear about some messianic prophecies. Uh, just a word. So just, just so you know, um, uh, 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 you know, much of this information is coming from just a spectacular commentary by Dr. David Block. So um, if you have the notes, you'll notice uh, you know, numerous references to his commentary. It's a very intellectual, scholarly commentary, but... It's so it it's so helpful because he you know he gives the Hebrew and he gives a lot of the meanings and the reason I'm using that particular commentary is because uh, primarily is because it was when I was researching looking up you know what are some of the best commentaries on Ezekiel his was mentioned um, you know as 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 one of the finest so without further ado let's jump in to Ezekiel so we begin let's do the first three verses of chapter eleven Ezekiel says. The Spirit lifted me up and brought me to the east gate of the house of the Lord. The house of the Lord is the temple, um, which faces east. And behold, at the door of the gateway, there were 25 man, men. And I saw among them Jezaniah, the son of Azur, uh, Palatia, the son of Benaniah, princes of the people. And he said to me, Son of man... These are the men who devise inequity and who give wicked counsel to in the city, who say the time is not near to build houses. This city is the cauldron, and we are the flesh. Therefore prophesy against them. Prophesy, O son of man. Okay, so what's, what's happening here? Okay, so of course the Spirit lifts Ezekiel up and he brings him to um, the temple. And two men, with very difficult names to pronounce, are mentioned. Uh, Jezania, uh, Palatia, Palatia, and they are described as being princes of the people. Um, so Bloch says in his commentary, they, they appear that since the exile... Because remember, a number of people have already been taken into exile in Egypt or in Babylon. Ezekiel, of course, is in Babylon. That some of these people have kind of stepped up into leadership roles in the community. And these two men are described as devising inequity and giving wicked counsel. And in addition, they're feeding the people a lie. They're giving them a false message of their coming faith. They're essentially saying that the destruction that is being foretold, like people like, excuse me, like Jeremiah and of course Ezekiel, will not happen. So build houses. 
This is not going to happen. Okay, so they're giving the people this false hope. When the people should be um, repenting and turning towards the Lord, they're giving them a message of peace and security. So verse 4 through 13. Therefore, prophesy against them, prophesy, O son of man. And the Spirit of the Lord fell upon me, and he said to me, Say thus, says the Lord, So you think, O house of Israel, for I know the things that you that come into your mind. You have multiplied your slain in the street, and have filled its streets with the slain. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Your slain whom you have laid in the midst of it, they are the flesh, and the city is the cauldron. But you shall be brought forth out of the midst of it. You have feared the sword, and I will bring the sword upon you, says the Lord God. And I will bring you forth out of the midst of it and give you into the hands of foreigners and execute judgments upon you. You shall fall by the sword. I will judge you at the border of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord. This shitty city shall not be your cauldron, nor shall you be the flesh in the midst of it. I will judge you at the border of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord, for you have not walked in my statutes, nor executed my ordinances, but have acted according to the ordinances of the nations that are round about you. And it came to pass, while I was prophesying, that Palat Palatia and the son of Benaniah died. Then I fell down my face upon my face and cried with a loud voice and said, Ah, Lord God, will you make full end? Of the remnant of Israel. Okay, so what's what's happening here? Okay, so basically, um, God knows the corruption that's in their hearts and how they had multiplied the slain in their city. And according to Block in his commentary, the slain that Ezekiel is referring to here are those who have been put to death through immoral judgments. So basically, um, false courts that are, you know, obviously are wrongly um, executing justice. And what the Lord is saying, hey, look, the sword is going to come down. The sword, of course, uh, wielded by Babylon, is going to come down on you. You're going to be handed over to foreigners, the Babylonians. And... There, there's something interesting in this prophecy, and it kind of jumped out, and I knew I had to look into to it further. He says, I will judge you at the border of Israel. Okay, that's kind of interesting. Not that I will just judge Israel, but I'll judge you at the border of Israel. So what does that mean? Um, there was basically this belief um, that God would not and could not, so to speak, um, allow them to be conquered that God had this, uh, the commentary puts says, God had this obligation to um, prevent them from ever being totally conquered. However, Ezekiel shows, even if they escape Jerusalem, the enemy would get them. So not only will judgment come upon the city, but all the way at the borders of Israel. They're, they're, basically, there's no escape from this judgment. Okay. There's no escape. Even if you get out of Jerusalem or you go to a different place, this judgment that is being executed, I mean, I mean the Babylonians are carrying it out, but God is permitting it to, to be carried out, is a judgment on the people because of their sins. Okay? And in verse 14, Ezekiel, and the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel again. And he says, Son of man, your brethren, even your brethren, your fellow exiles, the whole house of Israel, all of them are those of whom the inhabitants of Jerusalem have said. They have gone far from the Lord. To us this land is given for a possession. Therefore, say, thus says the Lord God, though I remove them far off among the nations, and though I scatter them among the countries, yet I have been a sanctuary to them for a while in the countries where they have gone. Okay, now, there's, there's a little bit here. Actually, more than a little bit. So, again, doing the, you know, looking into this, doing the research, you know, looking in the commentaries, you know, seeing what, what, um, what, what some of the, the attitudes, what, what's being said here beyond the letter. Because, you know, you know, it's important with the prophets, I think, 
it's important with all books of scripture, of course, but I think especially with the prophets is that there's a lot of history involved. And unless somebody, you know, is an absolute scholar on Ezekiel, um, you know, it's, it's tough. The prophets could be tough. And that's why I think sometimes at Mass we hear these prophecies, you know, I mean, granted, we know like Isaiah, virgin shall conceive a bear, so like, like, you know, there's some very, you know, well-known prophecies. But in general, when we read the prophets, and I found this out, I found this to be true for a number of years. It's like, okay, I don't, like, what's going on? So it's always important to, to have the context. And again, I can't brag enough about the commentary, which is just helping me so much um, to articulate what's going on in Ezekiel. So anyway, so the inhabitants of Jerusalem um, believe, so the people still in Jerusalem believe that Judah now, Jerusalem, was their inheritance. And in their thinking, they're thinking, oh, those people who have gone into the exile, they are far from the Lord. That they are have been rejected by God. Okay. So, like, the exiles. Man, I don't know what they did, but God got them out of the city. We're kind of the elite. We're the special ones. But they're going to find that's not true. But what did God say to Ezekiel? He said that he would be a sanctuary for the scattered of Judah. Now, why is this important? We have to think how they, how the Israelites, how the people of Judah would have thought in that time. God would be a sanctuary for them in a foreign land. He would be with the exiles in their time of suffering. And what is this showing? And this blew my mind when I read this in the commentary. What God is showing here is that the, the exiles would be, would have access, would be permitted to have intimacy with the Lord outside the temple, outside Jerusalem, outside the land of Judah. And this would have been nothing short of revolutionary. Because remember, they knew that God was the creator. He transcended all creation. But God was very, um, if you want to say specifically located, his presence in the temple. And that is true. But what God is saying is, look, okay, it's not like somehow I'm just bound to that land. I'm going to be a sanctuary to you. I'm going to be with you in exile. I'm going to be with you when you're out in this place. Now, of course, in the New Testament, with Christ, we understand that. I mean, we, under, you know, we could be, you know, uh, imprisoned in a foreign country, as, as, as Catholics have throughout the centuries, and yet we know that Christ is with us and we could pray and that he would be close to us. But this, this is very radical, what Ezekiel is saying. And, you know, I couldn't help think when I was, when I was reading this, Made me think of the story from John's Gospel, John 4, with the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well. Okay. Basically, um, she, well, let me, let me read the passage and then we'll unpack it. So, our, so Jesus, you know, goes to the well and the woman's there in the afternoon and Jesus, you know, asks her for a drink of water and she's like, okay, what the heck? first of all, Jesus, like, men didn't approach women, you know, a, a, an unaccompanied woman. Secondly, she's a Samaritan. So the Jews literally, even though it was, it, was, it was quicker for a number of them to get to Jerusalem by crossing through Samaria, they wouldn't do it. They would literally go around the territory. Okay, so like, here's Jesus in Samaria, and he's going up to a woman and asking her for a drink of water. So, she poses this question to him. She's like, okay, well, where's the proper place to worship? Because the Jews say you have to worship in Jerusalem, and the Samaritans say you, you worship on Mount Gerizim. Where do you say it's a proper place to worship? So she said, our fathers worship on this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such the Father seeks to worship him. So what does this mean? 
in the new covenant that Jesus is, Jesus establish, establishes, there's not going to be one designated place for worship in the sense of the temple. That's the only place the Jews could offer sacrifice at. Yes, you could have synagogues, but where the sacrifice takes place, you know, where the, where, you know, the Passover lambs are, 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 are offered to God, this can only take place in this location. Jesus said, no, 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 no. In the new covenant, you're going to worship not on this mountain, not in Jerusalem, but in spirit and truth. What does that mean? Well, think about our Mass. Mass, of course, should be celebrated in church, but it doesn't always have to be. Obviously, there's outdoor Masses, there's priests celebrating Mass, uh, mass in battlefields, um, in, the, in the jungles, wherever. In airports, and I know one priest, he was stranded in a snowstorm, and he just said, he went to his hotel room, he celebrated Mass by himself. So, in spirit and truth. So when Christ is going to send the Holy Spirit, okay, all people will have access to the Spirit. And the Spirit makes it possible for the priest to bring about the most, the true and perfect form of worship. Obviously, that's in the Eucharist. So the Mass, the perfect form of prayer, the perfect uh, worship, act of worship, can be offered anywhere in the world. So as Catholics, yeah, it's great to go on pilgrimages to Rome and the Holy Land. If you could do that, that's awesome. But you don't have to. It's not a requirement of the faith. You know, maybe, you know, some people maybe will never go, um, you know, beyond the bounds of their diocese. You know, in the past, people, most people probably didn't really travel out of their neighborhood. But they could go to their church and they would encounter Christ just as, you know, the Pope would celebrating Mass in Rome. So Christ inaugurates this kind of universal worship. And this, I believe, is what is, is being foreshadowed here. When God says, I will be a sanctuary to you in this foreign land. Because in the New Covenant, God is a sanctuary for people all over the place. And here, I think it's slowly starting to, um, you know, kind of turn their thoughts to this idea. Again, it will be fully revealed by Christ, but it's starting to say, okay, God is not strictly bound. You can only worship him here. But he will even be with you in play, in foreign lands where you think, well, God wouldn't be there. So it's interesting what's taking place. Now, it only gets more interesting because in verse 17, or verse 17 through 21, we read, um, Therefore, Say, thus says the Lord God, I will gather you from among from the peoples and assemble you out of the countries where you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. And when they come there, they will remove from it all its detestable things and all its abominations. And I will give them one heart and put a new spirit within them. And I will take the stony heart out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances and obey them. And they shall be my people and I will be their God. But as for those whose hearts go, heart goes after their detestable things and their abominations, I will repay their deeds upon their own heads, says the Lord God. Okay, so what's happening here? Well, the Lord revealed that he would gather together his scattered people and bring them back to the land. So what is God describing? He's describing a new exodus. There'll be this new exodus back to the promised land, just like the first exodus came from a foreign land, the land of Egypt, back to the land. Okay. Now, God will lead his people out of oppression uh, of Babylon to the promised land. However, that's kind of like maybe step one. But God doesn't stop there. He doesn't just say, hey, you're back in the land. Okay, you know, clean it up, get it built again, and, you know, I'll be with you. No, no, he talks about giving them a new heart and a new spirit. Okay, so he talks about how these people who return, and again, people in not just, you know, that generation, but obviously their descendants, this, this, this people that will be there. Um, um, that they'll be renewed. They'll be different from the people that were in the exile. 
So, for example, um, they'll remove the abominations that polluted the land. So the idols, um, the different shrines. They'll remove those. Okay. And in this exodus, they will not long for Babylon. So if you remember, in the first exodus, all the Israelites did was complain. Oh, Egypt is amazing. There's cucumbers, there's leeks, there's garlic, and we're out here starving, eating bread. Um, so they complain. So they're not going to long to go back to Babylon. Okay. But also, in the first exodus, one of the things God commanded them to do, he says, when you come into the land of Canaan, you have to remove all, remove all this pagan stuff. You have to tear down these shrines in these places of worship. You have to uh, remove these abominations. Well, of course, to one degree they did, but to another degree, no, they actually indulged in all these practices. Okay? So, God, this new generation coming in will, will remove these things. And this is why in the time of Jesus, when Jesus, Jesus doesn't focus on them worshiping false gods. I mean, he'll refer to money as a god, things like that. But he will not, you know, say, okay, guys, we can't have Baal worship here. We can't, you know, we can't have Asherah worship or Moloch worship. That has been purified out of them by the time of Christ. Like all that paganism that we saw, uh, you know, prior to the exile, and even during the exile to an extent, will be purified out of them. But then God says something else. So, so in one sense, maybe this is step one. This is, you know, they come back to the land, they remove a lot of these things. Okay, so yeah, I guess you could say in one sense they're renewed. But how is that going to stick? Because if you read the Bible, one of the things you know, maybe this generation is holy, but the next generation becomes a simple generation. So how are these people really going to be renewed? Well, God says this. I will give them one heart and once and put a new spirit within them. Okay, so I'm going to take their stony hearts and give them hearts of flesh. And this way they'll be able to walk in my statutes and I will be their God. Okay, well, how's he going to do that? Now, notice this. We have to look at Jeremiah. So Jeremiah is a little older than Ezekiel, but he was, you know, around before the exile and he was taken to the exile, except he wasn't taken to Babylon, he was taken to Egypt. Okay. So Ezekiel has a very similar prophecy. Ezekiel says this, or I'm sorry, Jeremiah says this. He said, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke and I showed myself their master, says the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my, notice the similarities, I will put my law within them, and I will write it upon their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each man teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. So just, just, I put a chart in the notes, but if you look on um, the notes, you know, Ezekiel emphasizes that God is going to give them one heart. Jeremiah says that God will write the law on their hearts. And the heart, of course, is, is like the depths of the person, like, like the core of the person. Ezekiel says that God will put a new spirit within them. Um, Jeremiah says the Lord will put the law within them. Ezekiel says, uh, you know, uh, or has, you know, God says through Ezekiel, they shall be my people. Through Jeremiah, he says, they shall be my people. Um, God says, I will be their God in Ezekiel. And God says, I will be their God in Jeremiah. So there's a lot of similarities between these two prophecies. So we have to ask the question, though, how are they going to be of one heart and, and have a new spirit? Because like we said, even if they return in this, like, this, this generation that returns, they're like saintly people. That doesn't mean their children will be saints. Okay, so God revealed through them through his prophets that he would accomplish this through the Messiah because the Messiah would make it possible for people to live. So Isaiah says this concerning the Messiah, as for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord, my spirit, which is upon you and my words, which I have put in your mouth shall not depart out of your mouth 
or out of the mouth of your children, or out of the mouth of your children's children, says the Lord, from this time forth and forevermore. So, the Lord, speaking to the Messiah, says, My spirit which is upon you, and we saw the spirit come upon Christ at his baptism, and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart out of your mouth. So Christ was always faithful to the will of God. He's the new Adam. Or out of the mouth of your children, or the mouth of your children's children. Okay, and, and this has to do with the um, the disciples, those who are born again through the Messiah. Obviously, we know that happens through baptism. So this truth, the word of the Lord will not depart because through the Messiah, God is going to make this possible. Okay? Now, the Lord said that he would make a new covenant. He says this in Isaiah. He says this in Jeremiah. And he will say this specifically in Ezekiel. But it's all... Ezekiel, this all has to, is, is building up toward this new covenant. The Lord's Spirit is upon his servant, the Messiah. And through this Messiah, God's Spirit and Word would be with the Messiahs and his children uh, forevermore. Okay? And, and some of this information on Isaiah is coming from the commentary written by Alec, Dr. Alec Mo, Mo, Moyer. Awesome commentary on Isaiah. So if anybody ever wants to go really a deep dive, it's very like it's very academic, but it's very uh, it's just chock full of information. It goes through all these passages uh, uh, in such depth. Anyway, um, so when does this new covenant become established? Well, the new covenant was established at the Last Supper. So we know Christ was celebrating the Passover, and then he gave new meaning to it by offering up the bread and wine. Okay, and Christ said, uh, in referring to the chalice of wine, which he declared to be his blood, he said, the chalice which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. So when you go to Mass, the priest is going to say, this is the blood of the new and eternal covenant. That new and eternal covenant, yes, Christ calls it the new covenant, but um, when you go back to um, the prophets, they all speak of this coming new and eternal covenant. Okay. So Christ establishes this new covenant. Even in the letter to the Hebrews in the New Testament, we read, therefore, referring to Jesus, therefore he is the mediator of a new covenant. So that those who are called may receive the promised internal inheritance since a death has occurred which redeems them from the transgressions under the first covenant. So the first covenant they keep referring to is the covenant that took place at Mount Sinai when the Israelites were given the law. Okay, and we know they transgressed the law. Okay. So this new covenant makes it possible to live out, makes it able to live out of the law of Christ. Now, how are they able to do that again? Yes, their sins will be forgiven through the Messiah, but also they're going to receive a new spirit. They're going to, they're going to receive the Holy Spirit. So what does Peter say at Pentecost? Now, think of this at Pentecost. You have this, the outpouring of the Spirit upon the apostles, right? But it's not solely for them. They want to give this spirit to others. So when people, when Peter actually is giving his first sermon, he tells the people, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And through the forgiveness of sins, which the new covenant brings, and the new covenant is gives us the Holy Spirit, we are able to live out the ordinances of the law. We are able to live live the way that God wants us to live. We are able to love the way God wants us to love. It's possible now because, not because of our own strength or merits, but because God has given us his divine life, his grace, flowing through us, comes to us through the sacraments in order to live this way of life out. So this is what Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and Isaiah are all anticipating with the Messiah. Okay? Okay, so lastly, lastly, um, in verses, sorry, 22, verses 22 uh, through 25, it said, The cherubim lifted up their wings with the wheels besides them, and the glory of the God of Israel was over them. And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood upon the mountain, which is on the east side of the city, and the Spirit lifted me up, and brought me in a vision by the Spirit of God into Chaldea to the exiles. Then the vision that I had seen went up from me, 
I told the exiles all the things that the Lord has showed me. Okay, so we have, you know, kind of, uh, again, the glory of the Lord leaving, and Ezekiel's brought back to the people of Babylon. Okay? So, chapter 12. Okay, we're moving right along. So 12, let's read the first couple verses. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, you dwell in the midst of a rebellious house. Who has who have eyes to see but see not? Who have ears to hear but hear not? Okay, so the Lord comes to Ezekiel. And this is something we heard earlier in Ezekiel. And he calls the people, the exiles, a rebellious house. Okay. And they're not really able to see or hear. And this is, of course, in reference, they're not able to really understand what God has planned for them or what God is doing in their life. They just want to go back to Jerusalem. But they're not really, they're not sorry for their sins. They just want to go back to Jerusalem. Okay. Okay. So, why, why are they considered rebellious? Well, in the commentary, Block says that possibly... They may have refused to accept the fact, because Ezekiel was saying this, that Jerusalem could ever be conquered. So they may be saying, no, that's not true. So they're opposing the prophet, which by opposing Ezekiel the prophet, you're opposing the Lord. Um, also, maybe, you know, because Babylon was ruling over them, they just expected a speedy liberation. Um, or, you know, it's just an outright rejection of Ezekiel's prophecies. Okay. But... Ezekiel, through his ministry, is emphasizing to them, to the because remember he's ministering to the exiles, that they um, are not somehow better than the people in Jerusalem. They're just rebellious as them. However, God is, his intention was to renew their people, renew his people through the exiles. So this renewal is not going to take the place, or is not going to occur excuse me, with the people left of the city, it's going to occur with the people who are scattered, who are in places like Babylon. So what does God tell Ezekiel to do? Okay. In verse 3, he says, For they are a rebellious house, therefore, son of man, prepare for yourself an exile's baggage and go into exile by day in their sight, you shall go like an exile from your place to another place in their sight. Perhaps they will understand, though. They are a rebellious house. You shall bring out your baggage by day in their sight as baggage for it, for exile. And you shall go forth yourself at evening in their sight as men do who must go into exile. Dig through the wall in their sight and go out through it. In their sight you shall lift up the baggage upon your shoulder. And carry it out in the dark. You shall cover your face that you may not see the land. For I have made you a sign for the house of Israel. Okay. So, God tells him to make this sort of baggage. Okay. This is what's called an exile's baggage. And what's interesting when I was looking into this. So, archaeologists have discovered, this is from Assyria, images of captives with large bags hanging over their soldier, so, uh, shoulder. excuse me, And... Basically, they would. This would have been very familiar to the people because, you know, they would have carried whatever they could in this baggage into Babylon. Excuse me, I'm yawning like crazy. Um, so Ezekiel, by putting on the exile's baggage, is supposed to mimic an exile in the sight of the people. Okay, and he's doing this. He he's doing this performance, so to speak. In, to help them understand God's will. But however, God says they're not really going to understand because they're in a state of rebellion. Okay? So in the morning, Ezekiel's supposed to take his baggage and place it where everyone can see it. In the evening, while people are still watching, he's supposed to go forth like one in exile. Okay? Um, in addition, God instructed Ezekiel to, to dig a hole in the wall and climb through it with the people watching. Okay? Um... And when I was reading in, in Black's commentary, he said, oh, he would have been very, it would have been very easy to dig a hole in the side of the house because the the houses were made of like sun-dried mud bricks. So he would have been able to, to dig through it and then crawl through it. Um, and, and Black points out that this hole and Ezekiel crawling through this hole probably represents the people of Jerusalem trying to escape the condemned city when the Babylonians finally destroyed Jerusalem. Um, 
So probably it represents the inhabitants. Um, or, or I should say it could represent the inhabitants trying to escape. Or Black says it could represent the Babylonians. Um, this is what he believes, who broke through the wall of the city and are coming into the city. Okay, because remember, what the Babylonians did when they finally attacked, they created what's called siege works. They surrounded the complete city, so no one could go in, no one could get out, supplies couldn't come in, supplies couldn't go out. So basically starving the city. And finally they broke through the wall and captured it. Okay? Now, in verse 8 through 14, Ezekiel's going to give the whole meaning of this. And he says this, he says, In the morning the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, has not the house of Israel, the rebellious house, said to you, what are you doing? Say to them, thus says the Lord God, this oracle concerns the prince in Jerusalem and all the house of Israel who are in it. Say, I am a sign for you. As I have done, so shall it be done to them. They shall go into exile, into captivity. And the prince who is among them shall lift his baggage upon his shoulder in the dark and shall go forth. He shall dig through the wall and go th out through it. He shall cover his face and he will not see the land with his eyes. And I will spread my net over him, and, shall, and he shall be taken in my snare, and I will bring him to Babylon in the land of the Chaldeans. Yet he shall not see it, and he shall die there. And I will scatter toward every wind all who are round about him, his helpers and all his troops, and I will unsheathe the sword after them. And they shall know that I am the Lord when I disperse them among the nations and scatter them through the countries. But I will let a few of them escape from the sword, from famine and pestilence, that they may confess all their abominations among the nations where they go and know that I am the Lord. Okay. So what's happening here? Okay. So the following morning, the Lord asked Ezekiel if the people had questioned him about like what he was doing. So like, I mean, take it, you wake up and, and there's Ezekiel you know, the prophet, and he's putting baggage out. He's crawling through his wall. He made a hole in his house, and he's crawling out the hole. Like, I mean, you're going to have some questions like, hey, what are you doing? Okay. Because, and it appears, what was pointed out in the commentary, that when Ezekiel's doing these things, he's doing them in silence. So he's not necessarily supposed to, he's not supposed to say anything. He's just supposed to perform them. And then, of course, the next day, he explains everything. So he says the message has to do with the prince in Jerusalem, okay? And this prince, most likely, he's referring to as King Zedekiah. Okay, this is the last of the kings. Okay. Um, and by calling him a prince and not a king, uh, Block believes that Ezekiel's kind of drawing into focus the reality that the last few kings have been vassals to Babylon. Babylon has really been the, the ones in charge, okay? Um... So Ezekiel is stressing that the prince and the people are going to go into exile. Um, and in regards to, uh, highlights, highlights Zedekiah taking his baggage and escaping in the growing darkness. However, the Babylonians will capture him. So Zedekiah does try to escape and he is captured. Ezekiel tells us that he will cover his face, that he cannot see the land. This probably meant that he will never see Jerusalem again. Okay. The Lord said that he would cast his net over the prince and capture him. The Lord declared that he would be brought back uh, to Babylon, but would not see it. Um, and this is probably a reference to Zedekiah's eyes being gouged out. So what happened was, when they finally attacked Jerusalem, this has not happened yet, the king, Zedekiah, escapes. He's captured. Before they kill him, they, they captured his sons, and they murder his sons in front of him and make him watch. Then they gouged out his eyes. And then they brought him into Babylon. So not only he would die in Babylon. So not only will he never see Jerusalem again, but he doesn't even see the land of Babylon because he is blinded. So that's how the Babylonians treated Zedekiah. And then the other people who are scattered about, they're just fleeing the city, will be uh, pursued by the sword. But God said he'll permit some to escape so they could tell what happened to the nations. Okay? And... In verse 17 through uh, 20, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me and said, Son of man, eat your bread with quaking, and drink water with trembling, and with fearfulness, and say of the people of the land, Thus says the Lord God concerning the inhabitants of Jerusalem in the land of Israel. They shall eat their bread with fearfulness, and drink water in dismay, because their land will be stripped of all it contains on account of the violence of all those who dwell in it. 
and the inhabited cities shall be laid waste, and the land shall become a desolation, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So again, Ezekiel is supposed to act out something else. He's supposed to do another visual performance to communicate um, this message to the people. Basically, you know, eating bread and drinking water in fear. Okay, he's he's mimicking the people in Jerusalem. And he's emphasizing the land is going to be stripped of everything. Destruction will engulf the city. And the once fruitful land will be made a devastation. Okay, and he continues lastly, finishing up chapter 12. He says, 21 through 28, And the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, what is this proverb that you have about the land of Israel, saying the days grow long? And every vision comes to nothing. Tell them, therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will put an end to this proverb, and they shall no more use it as a proverb in Israel. But say to them, the days are at hand and the fulfillment of every vision. For there shall be no more any false vision or flattering divination within the house of Israel. But I, the Lord, will speak the word which I will speak, and it will be performed. It will no longer be delayed, but in your days, O rebellious house, I will speak the word and perform it, says the Lord God. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, behold, they of the house of Israel say the vision that he sees is for many days, hence the prophecies of times far off. Therefore say to them, thus says the Lord God, none of my words will be delayed any longer, but the word which I speak will be performed, says the Lord God. Okay, just this last part very quickly. Um, is he saying this. So this proverb, this, this, this saying the people are saying is the days grow long and every vision comes to nothing. Basically, what they're saying is, okay, all these prophecies, all these visions, I mean, these these don't come true. I mean, these are just things people are saying, and this is, or if it is supposed to come true, it's not going to happen in our lifetime. Okay, and God is emphasizing, no, 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 no. My word will be performed. And it is not far off, but it will quickly come and it will not be delayed. So, yeah, again, it's this, you know, the people are kind of hearing these prophecies and they're, you know, about the destruction of Jerusalem. And it's kind of like, yeah, okay, Ezekiel, maybe, maybe one day, but, you know, not really going to happen. But he's like, no, no, this is going to happen. Okay. And, the, the, you know, so the Lord is saying, okay, look, Ezekiel, tell them it's not going to be delayed. So you have to trust these prophecies. Okay, so not only do you have false prophets, but you have kind of the people's attitude. Yeah, yeah, okay, that's just like, oh, you know, Ezekiel the prophet, of course, he has to say something like that. Um, that sounds mysterious, but, you know, it's not going to happen. And so that's kind of the attitude. And speaking of the false prophets, when we get into chapter 13, which we'll do quickly, uh, the first seven verses, The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel. Prophesy and say to those who prophesy out of their own minds. I love that. Hear the, word of the, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God. Woe to the foolish prophets who follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. Your prophets have been like foxes among runes, O Israel. You have not gone up into the breaches or built up a wall for the house of Israel, that it might stand in battle in the day of the Lord. They have spoken falsehood and divined a lie. They say, says the Lord, when the Lord has not sent them. And yet they expect him to, to fulfill their word. Have you not seen a delusive vision and uttered a lying divination wherever you have said, says the Lord, although I have not spoken? Okay, just very quickly. So I said, you know, there's false prophets. And God says they're prophesying out of their own minds. Like basically, like they're making this stuff up out of their heads. I'm not speaking to them. They're just like saying this stuff. And, you know, they're, they're claiming it's from the Lord. Okay. And he describes them as being foxes among a ruined city. So they're basically like scavengers. And Ezekiel says, have you, have you not gone up into the breaches and built up a wall for the house of Israel that it might stand in the day of battle? And when I was looking into the commentary on this, what it's basically saying is Ezekiel describing Israel as a vineyard. And the wall is built around basically, uh, you know, most especially Jerusalem for protection. Now, if the wall was broken you know, like in a vineyard, you would have to either build it up or put somebody in that spot to protect the vineyard, of course, from animals. Okay, so the false, the pro, if you're really a prophet, you're supposed to protect the vineyard and you're supposed to lead the people to God, to repentance. 
but instead they're self-serving. So the image is of God battling against them. Okay? And supposedly, like, whenever these false prophets spoke, they would say, says the Lord. And Black says it's possible that by adding to this to the end of their words, they're, it's almost as if by saying that they can make it come to fruition. Um, you know, that God has to somehow go along with what's being, what they are stating. Okay. And then, Jer and, and just to give another example, Jeremiah describes the false prophets as this. Thus says the Lord of hosts, do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you, filling you with vain hopes. They speak visions of their own minds. So very similar wording. Not from the mouth of the Lord. They say continually to those who despise the word of the Lord, it shall be well with you. And to everyone who stubbornly follows his own hearts, they say, no evil shall come upon you. So they're basically confirming people in their sins. They're telling people what they want to hear. And of course, we see this in the church today. False prophets who tell people what they want to hear, and they're popular. And they say, you know, it's well with you, follow your own heart. And so, of course, these false prophets are popular because people want to be affirmed. And Ezekiel's challenging them. He's saying, no, you can't follow your own heart, you have to follow the Lord. And of course, Ezekiel is probably suffering because of that. He's probably being persecuted to a degree, rejected to a degree by the people. Okay, verse 8 through 16. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have uttered delusion and delusions, speaking of the false prophets, and seen lies, therefore, behold, I am against you, says the Lord God. My hand will be against the prophets who see delusive visions and who give lying divinations. They shall not be in the council of my people, nor be enrolled in the register of the house of Israel, nor shall they enter the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord God. Because, yes, because they have misled my people, saying peace when there is no peace. And because when the people build a wall, these prophets uh, daub, daub excuse me, it with whitewash. They say to those who daub it with whitewash that it is, shall fall. There will be a deluge of rain, great hailstones, will fall and a stormy wind break out. And when the wall falls, will it not be said to you, where is the daubing with what you daubed it? Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will make a stormy wind break out my, break out in my wrath and there shall be a deluge of rain in my anger and great hailstones in wrath to destroy it. And I will break down the wall that you have daubed with whitewash and bring it down to the ground so that the foundation will be laid bare. When it falls, you shall perish in the midst of it, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Thus will I spend my wrath upon the wall and upon those who have daubed it with whitewash. And I will say to you, the wall is no more, nor those who daubed it. The prophets of Israel who prophesied concerning Jerusalem and saw visions of peace for her when there was no peace, says the Lord God. Okay, you know, sometimes you're reading these things and you're like, okay, what? What? What's going on? Whitewash? What's he doing? What's falling? What's happening? And again, again, it, 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 we always need context for these things. Okay, so again, he, of course, so the audience Ezekiel is addressing, he's, he's addressing false prophets who are leading people astray. And the Lord declares that they shall not be in the council of my people, nor be enrolled in the register of the house of Israel, nor enter the land of Israel. Okay, so basically what God is saying, they'll no longer be considered as part of his people. They'll not be listed in the census of his people, the register. And lastly, lastly, they will not return to the land. So, so Black explained that very well. Black then especially helped me understand this. So using this metaphor to describe the false prophets, he uses the image of a house being built. And even though the construction of this wall, this, this building is shoddy, okay, they cover it with whitewash, right? So it's not going to hold up in a storm. But they just kind of cover over it. Oh, it's very nice. And how um, the Lord said his wrath would would topple the structure. So what, what are these false prophets doing? Okay, they're, they're saying all these false things. They're, they're lying to the people. And the people are trusting in them. They're trusting in their word. And all their words, all their false words are going to be destroyed and come to nothing when God's judgment comes and we see this today you know with you know i can't tell you how many examples you know people point out you know this priest said this or this person said this 
the fact of the matter is, look, the job of a prophet, and primarily the prophet is a teacher, is to just speak what the Lord says. It's not to give your own take or how you feel it should be. You're just supposed to present the truth of the gospel. Ezekiel is presenting the truth of what God is saying. But the false prophets realize, hey, you know, people don't really like what God says because it's challenging and it's judgmental and, it, you know, it doesn't make me feel good, so I'll tell people what they want to hear. But as God says, this is not going to stand up. When things really get tough, this is not going to stand up. Okay, let's wrap up chapter 13. And we're on chapter 1, verse 17. Okay, and you, son of man, set your face against the daughters of your people who prophesy out of their own minds, prophesy against them, and say, Thus says the Lord God, Woe to the women who sew magic bands upon all wrists and make veils for the heads of persons of every stature in the hunt for souls. Will you hunt down souls belonging to my people and keep other souls alive for your profit? You have profaned me among my people for handfuls of barley and for pieces of bread, putting to death persons who should not die and keeping alive persons who should not live. Buy your lies to my people who listen to lies. Wherefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against your magic bands with which you hunt the souls, and I will tear them from your arms, and I will let the souls that you hunt go free like birds. Your veils also I will tear off and deliver my people out of your hand, and they shall be no more in your hand as prey, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Because you have disheartened the righteous falsely, although I have not disheartened him, and you have encouraged the wicked that he should not turn from his wicked way to save his life. Therefore, you shall no more see delusive visions nor practice divination. I will deliver my people out of your hand. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Okay, what's happening here with these women? They're practicing sorcery, witchcraft, the occult. That's what they're doing. Okay, and basically, now Block says it's unclear because I was like, okay, the veils, the bands, what's... What are they doing? So it's a little unclear how this is all being carried out. Like, what exactly are the steps of the rituals, or what are the people supposed to do? But essentially, there these women through through this 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 practice as as it's sometimes referred to as the black arts. They're trying to manipulate and control people. They may even have incorporated Babylonian pagan practices, um, and they're living off the members of the community. Okay, so when people don't have religion. When people don't have the true faith, see, we're made naturally spiritual. A lot of times we'll turn to these things seeking answers. They turn to the occult. But the occult is always oppressive and it enslaves people. And so Black, uh, Black excuse me, yes, uh, believes that the mention of barley may have been uh, required payment of these women. And these women, you know, like I said, are living off God's people. However, uh, so they're like hunting souls. So they will not have the final word in this, but the Lord will uh, is against their rituals, and he will see that he delivers people from them and that they go free. So the Lord absolutely condemns what these women are doing. So again, in general, you know, amidst all this chaos that's going on, you have the people in Jerusalem, you have the exiles, you then have false prophets, not just in Jerusalem, but you have false prophets among the exiles, you have women practicing witchcraft among the exiles. So as you can see, which is probably very obvious to Ezekiel, there's a lot of purification that needs to happen. So no, you're not going back home anytime soon because you would go right back to these practices. So next time, we're going to get, um, we're going to get into some really cool ground. We're going to, we're going to talk more about their sins. But then we're going to get into chapter 16, which really kind of lays out God's relationship with his people. So I think you'll really enjoy that. But let's close in prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for watching this. I'll see you soon.